Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to Last Humans Tech. Today I want to talk to you about file systems, directories, and quotas. So first we would just want to talk about the different types of file systems. So you have your EX2, which is an older Linux file system. It has a max 2 terabyte individual file size and a max 4 terabyte volume size. This is a fairly older file system and one of its drawbacks is it has very long recovery times. Next came the EXT3, the X3 file system. It was very similar to the EXT2, however it was a journaling file system and it had faster recovery times than the EXT2. An important keyword there is journaling that you want to remember for EXT3. Now EXT4 was the next generation and it is the current generation file system for most of the Linux machines. And this one will support an individual file size of 16 terabytes with a volume, max volume size of one exabyte. That's almost impossible to even think about. That's so huge. And another advantage to EXT4 over EXT3 is it would use checksums for journaling so it had an even better system for journaling and recovery of errors. Now there was also a riser system. It is a bit older system and it is not compatible with the EXT systems as far as if you have them on the same machine they will not be able to communicate. The riser system just for information has an 8 terabyte individual file size and a 16 terabyte volume size. It is very efficient, but it is fairly obsolete at this point. Now you can have different EXT file systems on each different mount point in your system. So your system does not all have to be the same EXT type. You can have varying types depending on your needs. So let's go over your different file mounting points on the system real quick. So you have your slash dev, which is your device files. We did go through this in some earlier lessons. This will have a file for every device on your machine. Let's clear the screen. Then you have your boot directory, which of course is just for boot up. It is all your boot related actions. It is your grub, such as we talked about in a previous video also. You have your home directory, which is for your user storage files, of course. All my user storage files are stored in here in the home. Now you have swap, which of course we cannot CD into. The swap file system is a special type, and a lot of times it is called type 82. Just a key little fact and tip for you that could come up in an interview or a certification question. A swap file system is a type 82 file system, where that number is coming from is when you set up a partition for swap in your fdisk command you want to select type 82 if you plan to use that for swap later and generally the given standard you do want your swap size to be about twice the size of your ram or memory then we have the temp which is fairly self-explanatory it is just temporary files used let's go right into your slash usr user and this will include both system and user files. Then you have the var slash var directory, which is mostly logs, and it also has variable file sizes, files that will change size. And almost all of your logs on the Unix and Linux systems will be found under the var directory. Let's clear the screen a bit. Of course, the most common one you know about is your Etsy. This is all your system configuration files. This is probably one of the most important mounts in all of Linux here. It has all your system configurations. And finally, you have the root partition. Now this is not to be confused with the root root, the top level root. The slash root is root users home directory. We can confirm this by let's do a cat to look at a file 
We're going to look at the pass WD. We are going to pipe it to head to look at the top of the file only. We're going to use the lines option with the head and say the first line, one line. Let's see if this works and shows us the first line. There we go. So I just wanted to confirm with you right here, this is the home directory of the root user. So it is slash root. It is not root. Next, I can show you fdisk real quick, although we won't be able to really make any changes because I do have this disk already maxed out when I set it up for virtual. So the fdisk command, you would need to follow it up with your device name so it knows which disk you want to enter. And then you're going to get an fdisk menu. And you would use the p command. You can use m for help, which is self-explanatory there. And if you want to see all the options. But P would be similar to the P in the Solaris format, similar command here, where it's going to show you the partitions, which are on that particular SDA. And here you can see SDA1, SDA2. The 1 and 2 mean the partition number. So SDA1 means disk A, partition 1. SDA2 means disk A, partition 2. So that is how you would look at different partitions. You can use the L to list all possible types of partitions you can create. You can see how many partitions are available. It's really amazing. One particular one to pay extra attention to, remember we talked about it? The swap is type 82. That's an important key bit of knowledge that I've seen come up in a test question before. So make sure you just remember that little nugget right there. Then we can do an N if you wanted to create a new partition on this disk that we entered, which was dev SDA. As I've said, I cannot make a new one, but see what it says, because all my space is already taken. But just for fun, let's say we were going to make a primary partition. We're going to select P. And the partition number, I'll call it partition number 3, because we have partition 1 and 2 already, as you saw. And it'll give us the answer we expected, no free sectors available, because I did not leave any free unused space on this disk when I set it up with my Oracle Virtual Box as a virtual machine. Now, there is one other option. If you were able to make that partition, you would use the W, which will write and save that partition. And that is not working, of course, because we did not make any changes that W would be the same as the label command in a Solaris box. When you make a new partition, you'd have to label it to write it. That's the same here, but it's the W command to write your partition changes. Then, of course, you could reboot and see your new partitions. Now, let's just say we had created a new partition, even though we did not. You would then have to format it, so to speak, to create a file system on it before you could use it. So you would use a makefs command to create a file system. The dash t would be type, so we'd say ex4. And let's just pretend we made a partition 3, which we did not. This is how you would create a file system on that to make it usable. And we should see an error here. Correct. The, SD, the SDA3 does not exist because we could not create it. But after you make any partition, you always have to do a make file system on it with any file type of your choosing, and then a path to the new file system or partition that you created. Just for reference, you could also use the make riser fs command if you happen to be using the riser file system we talked about earlier. That's just a variation of this command. And one more command you would have is your make swap. Now remember, if you were going to make swap on a particular directory, you would need to have specified partition type 82 in your fdisk as you created that partition, or it would not work as swap. Let's just say that we had made the swap and made the file system. You would then need to use the command swap on with your new partition path there to activate that swap. 
Let's just go over the mount command, even though we don't have anything to mount right now. You would need to mount that file system, and you would again use a T for type ext4. Let's just say this wasn't a swap, so you could mount it as swap itself is not really a mountable file system. So that is the format you would use. The mount, the type, your raw disk path, and then where you wanted to mount it. The slash mount MNT is just a general temporary type of mount that a lot of people use if they just want to mount up a disk temporarily. Now do note that if you do use a mount command, after you reboot your machine, that mount is going to be gone. In order to have it stay, you would have to add it to the FS tab file. This is a system configuration file under Etsy which handles the disk and system mount points. So you can see here just as an example, it's all root here, basically one large disk the way I set it up virtually. But you can see that the FS tab shows a file type, ext4, and it shows a swap type for this particular file system. Let me show you one thing real quick here. If you wanted to set up quotas for this machine, after the defaults option, you would use user quota and you would use group quota also if you wanted to set up group quota. So you would add those two options to your defaults line here which shows your various options and you would then save and reboot and your quotas would be enabled on that particular system. But since we're not going to do that, you can see I'm still in insert mode. I'm going to escape out of VI to go to command mode. I'm going to go to colon to go to command line mode at the bottom there and I'm to quit exclamation which means quit without saving. If you had a W in there, you would be saving the file, and I do not want to do that right now. And after the system had reboot, let's say you had added those user quotas in there, you would use the ed quota command with a dash U to specify user and your username. Now this machine I know does not have that command currently installed, so I cannot show you this. But the ed quota command is very important. It's in some exam tests and certifications. Make sure you know the ed quota command is how you set up disk quotas for a particular user. Finally, let's look at the most common way to look at your disks here. A df-k is probably the most common command that everybody uses. And this is a quick layout of all the systems and your disk space and how full it is. You can use a df-h to show it in a more readable pattern where it'll show G's for gigabytes and M's for megabytes. And so the dash H you can throw in, which just makes it easier if you're kind of a more gigabyte, kilobyte type of guy. Or you can look at the raw numbers up above. Now you can check the inodes with the dash I option. So you should really know all three of these options for the df command. And this is going to show you available inodes. See that? So it has inodes, inodes used, inodes free, and the percentage of inodes. Because it is possible to use up all the disk inodes and not have your disk completely full. How this would happen is if you had tons and tons of tiny, tiny files, each file would use an inode. And it wouldn't necessarily use up all the space on the disk. So you really got to find that comfortable balance between inodes and disk space. The last command relating to the disk here would be disk uh, du, disk usage. You can see this is very unwieldy if you just use it like this. Of course, it is going to give you a disk usage of whatever directory you are currently in. Because we are in slash root, it's a very small directory and it's easy to use. Let's say we go to the Etsy directory and let's do a DU and it'll be a bit longer and at the bottom it shows your total kilobytes so that would be 30 megabytes in this Etsy directory so 30 you can also use a, a DU-S 
for summary. If you don't want to see all the files, you just want to see the total. So that would be the same, about 30 megabytes. So you want to remember your DF-K is most standard. DF-H shows gigabyte and megabyte, G's and M's in there. DF-I is how you check your inodes. DU will show you disk usage performed from the exact present working directory you are in, and it will not go out of that directory or higher. This concludes the lessons on the disk mounts, points, and file systems. Hope you have enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching Last Humans Tech, and I do hope you come back again.